Hi and welcome to another episode of Straight Out of Camera, proudly sponsored by Fujiform South Africa. Now this is our third episode and the genre we will be discussing today will be the art of taking the perfect street photography photo. photo. With me in studio, joining me live here is managing editor of techsmart.co.za, Mike Hubert. Mike, how are you doing? Morning, Esley. All well, thank you very much. Awesome. And live from Cape Town, we have commercial photographer Leon Westhuizen. Hi, hi. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Leon. So street photography, where do we start, Mike? What, what are we looking at? What is the typical sort of images that we want to showcase? Um, what is the gear that we need to have? And how safe is it to, to be shooting street photography? No, I'm not going to answer all those questions, but I, at least I can say this. It's, it's one of those genres that's easy to get into, but very good, uh, difficult to get good at. You know, it's one thing to point your camera at someone on the street, take a snap and move on. But the question I'm always stuck with is, what exactly is this photograph saying? You know, is it, is it just another passerby on the street? Is it another street walker, walker peddling their wares? Now, or you can actually learn something from the, the juxtaposition of the photo. Is there something about the composition? How does your subject mix with the background? All those things. Now, it, it's a difficult thing to get right on the spot. And for street photography, you certainly need not just an eye for quick shooting skills um, and a uh, proclivity uh, for finding really interesting subjects and uh, wonderful images at the same time. It's difficult to get right. Yeah, Leon, you you spoke mm. last week about cityscapes, and something that really tickled my fancy was the discussion with about urban photography. How uh -huh. would you mix that into your street photography? Good. Urban, urban is sort of like a well, for me at least, it's one of those genres or, or categories that falls into uh, both. It's one leg in one side, one leg in the other side of street and architectural, because urban urban isn't just your typical street stuff where people expect to uh, to have closer more intimate kind of portraits of people doing stuff on street but it's uh it's it incorporates the space around it so if it's if it's a town it, it tells a bit more of the town the architecture the way that the space is and the way that people move inside it um and and if it's a city obviously the similar kind of a thing where light bounces around and interesting shadows and lines form uh, so that so that the architectural details almost become equally or even more important um, the carrier that's for me that's how I would describe urban as opposed to street so when, when shooting street photography um, there's a lot that you could see from the images that get captured you could see the city the culture cultural aspects um, what are the things that you look out for Leon when you view street photography images the first thing that I try and look out for is uh, the, the light uh, that should be the case with any photography, but with street photography, you typically don't move around um, using using flash. Definitely not lots of it. If if anything, maybe some built-in or on-camera flash. So, so so you have to respond to what's available and in front of you. And for that, you need to almost slow your your shutter um, finger down and observe. You have to intensify your observational skills. That's that's where it all happens because the the split second when people have the exact right step. Or, or walk into a small pool of light somewhere where the composition is just perfect. That is that is part of the art of street photography. Those are the things that uh, that I would put high on my list of uh, my approach to to street photography. If you want to get into it, Mike and international photographers, we can look out for. Yeah, I think you just have to spend a few minutes on Instagram to see that there's some really awesome uh, street photographers out there. I still have this romantic notion of the uh, old masters loading film into a camera, uh, rangefinder, walking the streets of Paris and London. Um, but yeah, I think if, if you talk about those old photographers, you talk about guys like Robert Frank and his uh, In Your Face Americans, the astounding work of uh, Joseph Kudelka in Eastern Europe. Uh, Robert Dunois, uh, beautiful photographs of kissing lovers in the streets of Paris. And uh, locally, perhaps uh, far less glamorous, the photos of David Goldblatt and his book in Boxburg. Now, two names to me stand out. Firstly, you can't talk about street photography or actually photography in general without uh, mentioning French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson. Uh, he shot across the globe, was one of the founding members of the Magnum Photograph Agency. And uh, many of his photos are considered instant classics. Another guy to me is Elliot Irwood. Uh, it's an uh, um, icon of the photography world that's um, amazingly still alive. I think uh, what he brings to the table is not only a keen eye, but also an amazing sense of humor. You know, when you're shooting uh, street photography, 
that's an element that's a bit more difficult to bring into your photos than, for example, finding hardship or despair. Follow us on SOC underscore live, both on Instagram as well as Facebook, where we will have all the links to the photographers Mike has mentioned um, that has really inspired us from an international um, side on street photography. Now, Leon, I know you do a photo walk every month on the 15th. Um, do you do a lot of street photography in that walk? Uh, Isley, that's right. Yeah, well, I try and keep it to the 15th of every month. Sometimes things happen like GFX launches and things like that. But <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> if, if it's not overridden by something that cataclysmically huge, uh, I, then the 15th of a second photo walk is what we do. And it's on the 15th of every month and we shoot at a 15th of a second. Uh, that's the only rule. I don't care about exposure. I don't care about uh, the quality of the image. The point is to go and experience uh, guilt-free composition and just enjoying the light, getting out. And it is street-based. You're quite right. Uh, what that means, though, is very different. We apply that street theme to various areas depending on what day of the week it is because obviously people do street in the daytime and the evening. So if it's a midday uh, kind of a photo walk, then we'll use hard shadows. If it's a, a late night thing, let's say on a Tuesday or Wednesday, we might do uh, city uh, late night city stuff where the light is very different and, and you can expect um, completely different compositions and, and lighting approaches. And then obviously also uh, when, we, when we walk around shooting at a 15th, you are forced in a way to observe motion and life happening in front of you and, and try and incorporate that and, and, and how you technically approach that instead of um, bragging about the fastest lens or the best ISO performance because those actually don't, don't feature at all when you stop things down and, and only use a 15th of a second. Uh, so that's, that's part of the fun of the exercise. Yeah, I came to one of your walks when I visited Cape Town and it was quite interesting to see um, especially from exposure point of view, shooting 15th of a second at 4 o'clock in the afternoon is not easy. Um, and I, I, I utilized, if I can remember, your sunglasses to give me a little bit more, <laughs> cut the light out a little bit more. <laughs> that's, that's right. It's, like I said, there's no rules. Whatever you do to wrangle your exposure down to a 15th of a second. Um, at one of the walks, I uh, I had somebody that said that they, they have um, a camera that that I have some lenses for and they wanted to try it out so, so I brought all the lenses and things along I shoot with the same brand so I've got my XT2 she's got an XT10 everything is all cool and uh, I forget my camera at home now it's now it's uh, time to put my money where my mouth is and so I can shoot with anything so uh, so I whip out my iPhone and uh, I had my neutral density filters with me so I shot at a 15th of a second on my iPhone and I was pleasantly surprised at uh, at what I was able to, with lots of effort though, <laughs> able to wrangle out of this. But it really did force me into a corner to say, listen, I want to be able to shoot at this particular thing, uh, at this setting, and come a hell of high water, this is what's going to happen. Uh, and the same goes for for sinking your, your teeth into street photography. Just because you're on the street doesn't make it street photography. Leon. You need to really get into into the, uh, what's one say, the holding, the, the, the spirit of soaking up the atmosphere around you where you where you observe and document more than go out and just capture moments because that's snapshot um, photography. Leon, talking about soaking up the atmosphere, where do you walk to um, in Cape Town? Where do I walk to? Well, when you go <laughs> <laughs> on your walks. That's, in my photo walks, um, we, we spend time in places like wine farms or Cork Bay, which is a, a lovely fishing harbour. Maybe down in Simonstown, we've spent time in Seapoint, uh, in the city center itself. It's quite a popular one. A lot of people that have time to do this, the, the photo walks uh, come to the city center. And, and oftentimes we have tourists joining us as well because I advertise and then uh, we have people coming in from overseas that, that say, hey, we, we're going to be in, in town in April. Where is your photo walk happening on the 15th? And then they, they join us like that. So we, we try and wangle it. The, the, the day of the week dictates where we uh, typically go to. Leon, so there's a couple of photo walks up here in Johannesburg too. What do you think photo walks bring to the table when it comes to photography? Ah, I think photo walks in, in a way is almost like uh, going, going to a, a game reserve and doing wildlife photography. It's, it's very different from whipping out a camera with a long lens and shooting at wild animals. To, to really get into, uh, into that genre of photography, you've got to... Look at, look at what other people have done and define 
how you might approach it differently. So for me, I think street photography and, and photo walks in particular is a nice entry into getting to know people. Uh, the, the communities, pockets of people that are like-minded and people that are of a variety of different uh, levels of experience. That, and, and many of those are very keen to share, especially around the street photography thing. Um, and and when, you, when you do photo walks, it's, it's a great way to just say, listen here, this is me. It's some introductions. And, and you build communities rather than be isolated. Creatives tend to be quite isolated. And uh, I birthed my 15th of a second photo walk out of that frustration. It's like I'm not actually getting out and meeting people. I'm just going to put it, put it, uh, my colors to the mast and say, this is a photo walk. Please join me if you're keen. So we will share Leon's 15 second photo walk every month on our social media platforms, SOC underscore live. Now, before we, we go into the specific genre that we want to talk about today, Leon, are there any things that we can look out for happening in Cape Town next week? So this week, uh, up and coming in, uh, our social calendar in Cape Town, photography-wise at least, is a huge event going on. It's the awards evenings and uh, every, everything hot and buzzing around the Mercedes Boca International Film Festival. We have a bunch of great, great contestants who entered some 4K video uh, produced on XD2s. And uh, we will have a store there and a lot of great fashion things happening on the tickets available. Well, the, there was tickets available. I think they were selling like hotcakes. So... I think by the time this is, the tickets might not be available anymore, but there's a walk-in part of it. You're welcome to come and see the exhibits, uh, try try some of the cameras and see how that works. That's the thing that will dominate the photography scene this week. And uh, on Saturday, there's a second thing happening as well. There's a, a competition, inter, inter-group, uh, what is it, inter-brand competition, teams running against each other at a, uh, something called the Image Quest. And we, uh, against time, trying to find clues and photographing those in much of a street kind of a scenario so different teams have to find clues and go all around Cape Town and photograph them um, and on the same day those photographs will be printed exhibited and uh, the winners will be chosen and announced so that's quite exciting and that will be happening at Amplified Studios that's at Amplified Studio quite right awesome I also hear that you will have some GFX images um, at this on display there at the Mercedes Boca Film Festival that's right. Yeah, we, uh, in a very short amount of time, were able to capture amazing, amazing images. Uh, the guys at Mercedes at Century City have been super helpful. Uh, they've been very accommodating in letting us shoot there. And uh, we, we got a couple of great angles and we went with the idea. Well, I, I approached it uh, back to basics and, and just working with hard lines, strong contrast, primary colors of yellow, blue and red. And those made for really striking images, and I'm quite keen to see them printed up. It's going to be large banners if people want to see what the quality is all about. But also the GFX will be available. We'll have a setup, and if people want to stick their memory card into the camera and snap a couple of examples of, of our setup to go and take those uh, images home and see the quality for themselves, they're more than welcome to. Mike, chatting about street photography, I know that the cameras have really um, – got new great features like Wi-Fi, which makes it much more easier to shoot unobtrusive images with people actually not knowing that you're shooting them, which gives more emotive images at the end of the day. How would you approach that in a Bramfontein scene? You know, I'm slightly less, uh, more skeptical about that because, you know, there's something to me about shooting from the hip um, which many people do, and then just transferring the images to Wi-Fi so that basically uh, they can view the images afterwards, or actually composing your image uh, through the looking through the viewfinder, going to a lot of effort to to compose correctly. Uh, I like that approach. I think it, it it kind of there's something about being a photographer on a scene, taking photographs instead of just sh- shooting from the hips, hoping that you kind of grab the image. That's also why I like that. Uh, concept of Leon's uh, one fifteenth of a second. It really places you in touch with the camera. It places you in touch with the scene. Everything kind of had to flow together to make this one f- great photograph. Um, but at the same time, having said that, Wi-Fi is an amazing tool to get your photos onto Instagram as soon as possible. Um, it, it has certainly opened doors for many people um, to transfer images quickly uh, onto Instagram, Facebook, all those places. So, yeah, I think for, for modern photographers, Wi-Fi is a, is a must-do. I was in a situation where I was walking the streets of Mabuneng, 
um, we had the XT1 and I used my phone to, to actually use it as a triggering mechanism for the XT1 and also shooting from the hip but composing through my yeah. cell phone amazing and and i think that was was quite a nice unique tool some of the f the people that were shooting literally with a viewfinder um, people actually just didn't they they started posing they didn't want to have that sort of natural oh. feeling mm. that they would have you know without that so i think that was quite a nice sort of approach to take um the late, i can totally agree yeah the mm. late pine pinar um, one of probably Port Elizabeth's legends in photography. Um, we were sitting at a coffee shop and this lady with her husband and the newborn baby was sitting there. The emotion that you could see from the father to his daughter um, was just incredible. And me shooting that through a viewfinder would have sort of broken that sort of just that feeling. Mm. Um, and being able to do that on the Wi-Fi really, really captured that beautifulness and, and the prettiness of that moment. Um, so much so that I think the father was a little bit upset that he actually didn't know that we were shooting it and then I had to send him the email pictures. I'm still waiting for the thank you for the, the pictures that I showed, shared with him. But um, that's sort of the thing. You want to capture natural beauty. And unfortunately, big cameras, big lenses sort of kills that in a sense. Well, I think also, I mean, the fact that the father was slightly upset that he didn't know he was photographed. To me, there's an element of that that um, almost kind of sits not quite right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. Do you want photos where people are aware of the camera or do you want photographs that they might not be aware that you're shooting, but there's an element of almost like an intrusion to the, to the whole scene? I'm not quite sure exactly how to figure that one out for myself. Perhaps we can talk to uh, Neil Soden a little bit later and he'll be able to uh, tell us. Mm -hmm. Um, Mike, you, you mentioned uh, a couple of photographers there, uh, big names, big names, but one uh, that I'd just like to throw into the mix quickly is uh, a recent addition to the lineup, but her photographs have been around for quite some time, uh, only discovered recently, though, is Vivian Meyer. Yes, of course. Uh, there's There's been a very interesting documentary about the guy that discovered um, her work, and she's one of the most um, significant uh, image makers for, uh, of the 50s and uh, I think she was based around the New York area uh, and the, 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 the intimacy that she had um, and the rapport but she, she moved around almost ghost like um, mm. people didn't really know who she was and nobody spoke about her until after she passed away and somebody found all of her boxes of legs somewhere sold on a sidewalk um, so, so for me that that kind of answers a little bit of that question about how much do people need to be aware of the camera. Sometimes she shot people where they were fully looking into the camera and other times she was just shooting this, the, the street scene. Um, she shot with rally flexes so it was a top down thing and you could it doesn't look like you're looking at somebody because you're looking at the camera when you're looking down into it. Mm. Um, and it, it has a similar kind of a thing. Uh, I know some cameras have flip out and tilt screens. It works in a similar way. The moment you go Wi-Fi that's just taking it a step further. Um, what I have found with the Wi-Fi, though, is that it slows things down a bit. So you have to anticipate a moment. Um, there's a bit of a lag, a latency between when you fire it and when uh, when you press the button and when the camera actually fires. It's just a split second, but it, it uh, it's less immediate than having to do that on the camera itself. Uh, so you are able to get moments where in, in tight spaces where people otherwise would respond and, and not make an interesting image if, if they start posing. Different cultures do different things. I think the French don't care anymore. They just go, carry on smoking their gourds and having their espressos. Uh, but South Africans, I think, typically either run away or they start posing, and neither of those are uh, considered to be, be lacquer for street photography. Also, just talking about those through-the-lens cameras, um, top-down, very difficult to compose on those. I think hats off to anybody who has ever shot film on, on those cameras. Um, also, just shooting film, once again, you haven't got the option, uh, such as on digital, to just you know press the shutter button in and let it roll, you know, kind of like mm -hmm. a spray and pray approach. So perhaps for photographers who do want to get into film photo photography, I can really recommend it because it just slows the process down. It makes you really think about what you want in the photo. How are you going to take this photo? You've got one shot, so what are you going to do? So yeah, yeah for sure, definitely. Try or shoot with small memory cards. There you go. Oh, sorry? <laughs> or what shoot with small memory cards. <laughs> yeah, uh, the old ones, yeah. You're listening to brandlive.co.za.
Have you ever thought about the power of social media? Social media has the power to make your business grow. Grow! Yeah. Why don't you let us manage your social media? Because our business is to see your business grow. Visit us at www.beastownmedia.co.za. So our in-studio guest today is Neil Soden, a documentary street and fine art photographer from the mean streets of Johannesburg. He prefers shooting in black and white as it strips away the distraction of color, focusing more on the emotion of a photograph. Neil is also a bit of a gadget freak, tinkering and figuring out all the technical details of his cameras with road tripping, another one of his big loves. Neil, I didn't know this, but you're relatively new to the craft. You only started in 2006 and then became an ex-photographer in uh, 2013, seven years later. Yes, that's correct. Okay, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. How did you get into photo photography? As you said, I've grown up in Joburg most of my life. Um, I've always been interested in technology as I grew up with computers and ga gadgets in the house all the time. Um, when I left school, I kind of fell into the IT world. And then um, from there, when digital cameras came out uh, in 2006, I thought it was just an easy fit for me because as coming from an IT background. Um, that was the sort of dawn of the digital cameras from what I remember. And uh, from there, I just uh, I grew into it and slowly changed my sort of technique into, into street and documentary as I went along. Neil, I would, um, I'm quite interested always to hear what people's take is on the definition, um, their own definition of what constitutes street photography, because it, it varies from one person to the next and obviously affects the kind of images that you that that you are prone to see and uh, gravitate towards. And uh, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about your, your views on how you define street photography for yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, my street photography... <laughs> That's a hard thing to pin down as such because uh, particularly in the country we live in, it's always hard to, to, to do it on a regular basis and to find locations. So mine is always just as long as it's, it's um, got a lot of shadows and lights and uh, shadow and light and a lot of people doing stuff that they don't know that you're taking the photo. So they, they're just going by their day-to-day -day stuff. Um, for me, that's 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 the key. Uh, it's it's really hard to define it as a pure street photography. Sometimes it can be looked at as documentary. I suppose it's that's uh, it's a hard one, but yes, that's that's how I see it. I think that's quite a interesting thing that you mentioned. We're documenting your images. Um, when I look at your Instagram feed, for example, I can see that. How did you the progression from 2006 buying your first digital camera? How did you enter the street photography thing? Because normally we start off, we want to shoot weddings, we want to shoot portraits, we want to shoot, you know, just family. How, how did you progress from sort of that to, to defining yourself as a documentary styled photographer? Yeah, um, I started, when I first started, I started shooting with landscapes. Or one, the, they stood still so that I could take pictures. The, the other problem living in Joburg was that finding landscapes, you had to spend a lot of time in the car just to find the, the location. But what happened then is as uh, technology grew and, and cameras got smaller and uh, more discreet, I was able to now take my camera with me into places which, you know, generally is considered unsafe, but easier to carry around and, and less, you know, people don't see it. So going into the mirrorless uh, range of cameras, it made it a lot easier to to, to experiment in the street and you know the introduction of photo walks and uh, Instagram walks and things like that definitely helped grow that uh, from, from my, my personal point of view and uh, allowed me to to get around the fear to just go into into places which you think are unsafe. Neil you know when you hit the inner city you do come across a, a certain amount of poverty and also suffering What's your feelings in regards to the exploitative nature of street photography? Because there is a certain nature to just take the photo of the homeless guy. Uh, how do you feel about that? Is Do you feel that we've got some kind of responsibility or not really? I, I think we do. But um, when it comes to my street photography, I avoid those kind of pictures for the street. Uh, if I do take pictures like that, it would be more considered documentary, I think. Um, when I do streets, I look for more pictures of people just going by their day-to-day -day life, not suffering or, or having issues, uh, homeless. 
etc i look more for day-to-day stuff uh, people mm, i can i can totally agree with that neil uh and it, i find it's almost the the easy go-to when people think of street like you say mike uh the 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 idea that street has to be uh this very almost like a black and white hdr guy with um gray stubble and uh, a leathered face for, for me that is everybody's seen that image so I think once once you have that and you haven't shot one of those, get scratch that itch and get it out of the system, and then you can call it done. Um, there's so many more interesting angles to take. Uh, Mike, you mentioned Elliot Erwitt a little bit earlier. Um, he he did, for instance, uh, just a lifelong series on on dogs on the street. Um, and and with with that in mind, I think that's that's the kind of thing that you're doing, uh, Neil. Yes. You, yeah. you you're taking your own spin on it. We we street and travel almost become they intertwine so there's this what i've what i've seen with different guys is when they do street they do street plus urban street plus travel street plus documentary so, so street has it, it, it's always traveling with another buddy in a way it's never one thing on its own because it's really hard to define um and and my question for you is when when you are shooting in black and white do you how do you how do you prep your mind um for what it is that you uh, for where you are and what you want to see um, well, I, I generally don't deal too much with the technical aspect of the camera. I let the camera do what I wanted to do, to put in an auto as much as possible. And then I just adjust the, the exposure when needed. And then when I get to this scene, generally the places we go to, like Mobbening and uh, Neighbor Goods Market and even sometimes Melville, things like that where you, where you are a bit safer, uh, you know the scene and you've been there a few times so you understand where the light will be at a particular time of the year. So you just look for those shadows and lights and then just wait for people to, to, to approach the, the scene that you, you're looking at. Neil, what kind of focal length lenses do you use in your street photography? Um, it, when I first started, I started with the 50mm equivalent, so the 35mm um, on the crop sensor. And then now I just mostly shoot with the 35 equivalent, which is 23mm on the crop sensor. And that's my go-to lens for just about everything. And the nice thing about that is that if you land up taking a scene with a building in it, you can fit it in to some degree. And then if you turn around, you can take a portrait of someone in the environment as well, if that happens to to appear in front of you. Neil, we talked a little bit earlier about Cartier Bresson, and he he coined the phrase "the decisive moment," bringing to the table the thought that in one moment, all the elements that's needed in that to make the picture great is there and you either capture it or you're not. Are you a believer in, in, in that precise moment? Um, not totally. I think it's a lot harder these days because, uh, again, here at the safety level, you can't sit and take, uh, wait for those things to happen. You, you're a little bit faster on the, on the action here. So for me, I generally see a scene that's going to happen or, or is, is happening, and I'll try to take the shot and take two or three shots and then try to find from, from there which one I'll use and, and look for the emotions and, the, and the peop- what the people are doing. It's a lot harder these days. Also, my eyesight is not great, so um, I, I kind of just uh, go with, with, with my feeling more than, than what I see uh, in general. That's how I approach it. That's cool. Neil, and if, if somebody brand new to uh, photography or, or even just street photography were to approach and say, listen, can you maybe give me just your top five tips? What would you tell that person? Uh, one, keep your gear simple, very simple, and don't take bags and, and jewelry and, and branded products uh, all around you. Um, go to start off with also go in groups with, with people or, or, or uh, walks as, as, as you, you do in Cape Town. And uh, generally then also find places that are, that are safe to start off with, like uh, Mobbening and, and Neighbor Goods Market, etc. The other part is um, to shoot, I honestly think with, with the modern cameras, is to shoot it in black and white, uh, from straight in camera, because you, when you're looking through the, the electronic viewfinder, you're seeing the light hit the, the, the subjects or the, or the objects um, correctly and in the right color that you, or the lack of color that you, that you um, that you, you, you've, you've set. Taking in mind that that's, in most cases, only on mirrorless cameras that you can do that. Correct. Electronic viewfinder, yes. Uh, something that you said, um, Neil, is that um, you do a lot of walks or you go and shoot a lot in sort of Mabuneng neighborhood market area. And I think that's quite 
sort of a nice um, place to go and visit, especially on weekends when it's a little bit more safe. Um, a lot of our hipsters are are going there to enjoy the city life. Um, do you do you do you agree with that? Uh, I do. Um, the biggest thing problem with that though is that particularly hipsters they like to shoot with their phones and Instagram a lot. So what it does do is it it, it changes the the area, but because they're taking pictures of people and everything, and then people put their guard up because you now got all these these cameras. So I try avoid big groups when it comes to that, and I, I kind of stand more to the side if you're away from the groups and, and try and take the outlining area of what where that is happening because, again, then the people react to the photos and then they start acting and, and, and trying to get portraits and, and money out of you. So we briefly touched on this, the security aspect. It's definitely a concern in South Africa, uh, very much so in Johannesburg in certain areas. But we chatted to Anton Bosman uh, last week, um, talking about uh, cityscape photography and the fact that, you know, there are places in Johannesburg where I believe there's certainly amazing photography that needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about like really the inner city of, um, for example, Hillbrow, uh, just driving around there, perhaps on a Saturday morning. You feel that there, there's a story to be told there, but not a lot of uh, photographers are willing to go and risk their gear going to photograph that, those areas. It's a difficult one, I think. Um, you know, in South Africa, safety and security is always a concern. Yeah, and I, th I think uh, a lot of us have more fear than is, that is, that is needed, mm. um, but the fear is there. So I think you have to start in places that are safe and then you can start expanding your areas a little bit more and and going to areas even even when the guys go do lands uh, sorry uh, cityscapes inside town just go with them mm. you know and then you do your street while they're taking pictures of, of buildings and stuff that and that's that's the best way you can go approach it in mm. my opinion is mm. as long as you've got some support uh as some 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 groups then you, you're good yeah some of our photographers use the instax little share printer and when they do take a picture of a street or a portrait of someone, they tend to give them a picture just to s sort of show their um, gratitude yes. for, the, for the opportunity. And I think that's something that, that could work in your favor, especially in inner city. Oh, definitely, mm. definitely, yes. Also, if you move around, like you said, uh, with, with anybody who is already a known face in that community, uh, that's helpful and greatly beneficial because then there's a positive response and and also if you don't know the area then it's that's definitely security risk but if you go with somebody who already knows the area knows what what signs and things to look out for they could very easily say okay cool let's move on to the next next area let's get out of here um i was privileged enough to move around with uh, a, a youth worker um in one of our areas called Haderfelt, um which is which is known for a lot of um a lot of gang violence and and um drug drug sales and activity like that so uh, she's got such a passion for for uh, kids and especially girls um, that that grow up in that area. So she she took me around and she asked me to do some photographs uh, for for the uh, organisation's annual report, just to kind of show what the area looks like. So that was ideal. That was at the time the X100T uh, just came out, and and I took that along instead of any of the bigger cameras. So it looks firstly more like a film camera. So I thought that would be less less appealing to somebody who wants to nick it and uh and, and it's small and inobtrusive and I, I managed to find really intimate kind of moments pe people who pose and, and do do their things but without making too much of a scene because it doesn't look like a big production um have, have you had the privilege to to go around and find places and and how would you if, if you haven't how would you actually get yourself into a place where you force yourself to see something uh fresh uh, a while back, I did the uh, help portrait uh, stuff, and that was quite interesting because there you're mostly taking portraits and not so much street, but it did uh, allow me the opportunity to get into areas that I would generally not go to by myself, and, and it definitely opened my eyes to a lot of things. But again, going into those areas, it's always best to have someone that understands and, and, and is, is part of that culture. Neil, just to perhaps step away from street photography for a while one thing that i've noticed of your photos perhaps not your street photography but your other portraits and other casual shooting stuff is there's a certain sense of uh, delicateness to the photos 
it's not i don't want to say ex it's not exploitative it's very fine it's a it's a it's a nice uh, really beautiful post processing done to it what do you try and achieve with your photos um uh, what you that you put up into your portfolio uh the key thing for me is emotion um i look for emotion or or lack or lack of people looking at me or knowing that i'm taking a picture so the emotion that they're doing is just every day to day life um and then for me the post processing or that is i i keep it very simple as well i shoot in black and white i edit it in black and white and then i i don't do any uh, heavy processing to it and i don't know it's it for me it's hard to always define my own own work um but i i just love the keeping the emotion in the photo and do you prefer then shooting from the hip or really trying your best to compose correctly no no i i will compose i'll look through the viewfinder and and take the shot maybe two or three at a time and then just look for the right one but i always look for what's what is going on in the scene and then i and i will compose through the viewfinder how do you find emotion though i, I don't know um i i kind of th i think i just feel it in a way it sounds a bit airy fairy but i do definitely just look for it i think the key thing is to understand the scene that you're taking a picture of like what's actually happening what environment you're in and uh, i just look for for people doing stuff that that they would do and and it's it's a it's a hard one but i uh i, I look for for that how much time do you spend on post processing oh uh, i'm very quick i spend maybe two three minutes on each image that's it that's it and selecting images from your role uh well what i do i'm very fast so i pull it into something like lightroom and then i just i look at the photo paste my 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 film preset particularly the the ones from the the uh the camera i have the camera profiles and then i will uh just look at that if i don't want to reject it move to the next picture paste the, the preset and then and just move on and tweak it a bit if need be and that's about it so i was very fortunate to have met you when you started your journey with mirrorless cameras um, and the first one you had was an x100 you then moved over to an x pro and that's rangefinder cameras can you maybe just give us a little bit of information on why you like shooting on a rangefinder camera sure um one i don't smudge my lcd with my nose that's the first <laughs> thing yeah. and then Two, I I do like the camera to the right of my face so that on my my left eye can actually see the scene if I just open it quickly, and also it 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 doesn't hide your face. So when you put your face behind a, a SLR type design with the, the viewfinder in the middle, you hide your face a lot. So now with the camera to the right, it 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 just opens up your face, f particularly if you're doing like portraits of people and everything. So it, it, it they can see your face and your emotion on your face, and it helps connect with the people particularly portraits again uh, connect with the people that you that you're taking pictures and that's really it it also just looks really good we'll share some of um, neil's images on our facebook platform soc underscore live and we'll also share some of his exif data so that we can all try <laughs> and go and shoot street photography this week leon um what are we doing for the photo challenge I think it's a it's a very hard, very simple challenge. Uh, but to to shoot reductively is that's the hardest thing. It's in your mind because we always uh, defer to our gear as the thing that makes our images. But actually, those images are made in our mind. We decide when and what to uh, when to shoot and what to aim our camera at in the first place. What goes in the frame and what goes outside. So my challenge um, to everybody would be to shoot uh, in black and white. Uh, shoot raw and jpeg if you like the, the jpegs are saved as black and white by default and um, if you shoot in raw the color information is always retained so you if you want to go and fiddle later on you can but the immediacy of seeing your images made in black and white uh, that would be my first challenge and secondly if your camera can shoot in a different format like square um, or one by one aspect ratio try that as well because that will that will immediately force you to see things differently because the, the typical rectangle is designed um, around the idea of a golden mean. It's the most natural uh, rectangular shape. And, and once we start going for absolute square, it might feel a bit uncomfortable. And it, it's not the natural thing that you'd like to compose in. But it really does push you in a different level to kind of see something differently. Uh, 
shake it up a little bit and play with it, there's nothing to lose and uh, only only things to gain. Okay. Uh, also, what I suggest is if you can either uh, when you sh- either edit it in black and white, add a bit of red, uh, or shoot with a red filter on the black and white. And it helps particularly with skin tones and and your contrasts. Just a point on that uh, red filter. I really enjoy the red filters as well. It really brings out a lot of contrast and punch in the image. Uh, your your highlights and and shadows do different things, especially if you've got some blue sky in the background. That'll go nice and dark. Your clouds will be uh, more crunchy and more detail in them as well. Uh, maybe also just to put it out there, uh, the red filter would give you the most contrast. But if you're working with uh, uh, not Caucasian but slightly darker skin tones, um, maybe a good idea to also experiment with some other other filters like the orange and the yellows. Um, they, they provide different levels of the same same kind of idea of contrast. So those filters are are great once you start getting into black and white. So that would be a good challenge. Thank you very much, Neil, for joining us in studio, uh, Mike. Leon, thank you very much. Thank you, Wesley. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was Bye. great. Okay, yeah, if, um, what I can add to that is what I usually do is also use the black and white or the red filter. So if you either do it in post or put a UV, uh, sorry, a red filter on your lens, that does help with the contrast um, on the skin tones and, and the surrounding areas. True, true. Uh, for those of you that, that are shooting with the filters applied inside the camera, Maybe it's also a good idea to experiment a little bit with some of the yellow and the orange and the green filters. Those those provide different levels of contrast and filter out different things. Like Neil, you said uh, the red filter, that really applies a lot of contrast. Uh, it makes the, the blues, what would otherwise be blue in the photographs, go really dark. If you're shooting Caucasian skin, though, the, the red filter uh, can can sometimes make it look quite, quite light in comparison to everything else. And... Uh, possibly maybe try and apply the orange or the yellow filters to to lighter skin tones and when um i found when i when i shoot uh, darker complexions that's that's when the red filter really makes it for, for amazing amazing images you get a great glow to people's skin tones um but for urban definitely that the red filter is my default i love that thing and contrast is great uh, have have fun shooting black and white thanks neil thank you neil thank for you. joining us in studio uh, mike and leon it's always a pleasure Thank you, Wesley. Thank you. Thanks, guys. You're listening to brandlive.co.za.